Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to today's Chain Reaction Research event. I'm Matt Pietrowski with Climate Advisors, which is part of the CR Consortium with Aid Environment and Profundo. Our event today highlights 10 years of CR research and outreach and lessons learned over that time about how deforestation financial risks for palm oil, soy, and beef have evolved. And today we're excited to be joined by Green Century and Solidaridad. In the last decade, there have been large strides made in tackling commodity-driven deforestation. Awareness of the impacts of forest loss and degradation on climate change has grown. Deforestation rates in Southeast Asia have declined and corporate accountability and financial transparency and supply chains have improved. We'll be discussing these and more today, emphasizing lessons learned for the financial sector and other stakeholders. One note before we move forward, after this event, Chain Reaction Research will unfortunately be pausing our work due to lack of funding. We want to thank our funders over the years, including NORAD, Packard, Series, and EU Life. We appreciate their support for this important and impactful project, and we appreciate all the support we have received from our audience and groups that we have collaborated with. If you have any questions regarding CR's future, please feel free to contact us. We'll be providing our contact details at the end of this event. Now to the main presentation. Everyone in the audience is on mute, but if you have any questions, you can type your questions into the Q&A and we will aim to answer after our presentation. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Sarah Dross of Aid Environment. Hi all. Um, so my part of the presentation uh, will start with a discussion of trends uh, that we have observed in soy, beef and palm oil sectors over the last decade. I'm going to discuss uh, what lessons we have learned from 10 years of chain reaction research. And also I'm going to discuss some areas of concern where we see that the work hasn't been completed. So let's start with trends in the palm oil sector. Um, as most of you are aware, there has been a significant drop in deforestation in Southeast Asia. Um, and as chain reaction research, we see as the as the key explanatory factor, uh, the, the no deforestation and no peat and no exploitation policies, so-called NDPE policies, as a private instrument uh, that acted as a catalyst. So since 2014, there have been the largest palm oil traders and the largest palm oil producers that have started adopting these NDPE policies. And this acted as a as a chain reaction because uh, more and more companies uh, adopted these policies and they could not stay behind. Other than uh, this factor, there are of course also other explanatory factors or combinations of factors. So, for instance, the the Indonesian government uh, says that mainly the 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 drop in deforestation is due to the the government forest and peat moratorium policies. Uh, and while we agree that they are very uh, important, we also did research showing that there are still some loopholes in these policies and that there is also a lack of uh, effective implementation or lack of penalties for compliance with the moratoria. Uh, other than that, since 2020, uh, there has been unusual wet weather in Indonesia. Uh, although this might not be so unusual in the future with climate change, but because of this very uh, wet weather, there has been uh, no possibilities for some oil palm growers to develop their concessions that have been flooded. Also, since 2020, uh, there was a significant drop in palm oil prices globally, uh, and there's a, a correlate, there's evidence of a correlation between palm oil prices and oil palm expansion and deforestation. And then finally, final explanatory factor uh, might be that there's just simply too little forest left. So there are some locations, for instance, in North Kalimantan, where there's just simply no forest left to clear. So as a second trend that we have observed in the last 10 years uh, is that we have seen that there has been a reduction of actors involved in the leakage market. So a leakage market is a market that trades unsustainable palm oil from growers and producers that are not compliant with these NDPE policies. 
Um, so basically we saw and we did research on some leakage markets that uh, are still existing, such as Japan, China, and South Korea. So for instance, we, we saw that Japan is a large buyer of palm oil and timber products from Indonesia and that many palm oil companies in Japan do not have NDPE commitments. Also in South Korea, we saw that some of the largest South Korean companies, uh, they do even have oil palm plantations in Indonesia and they also buy significant amounts of palm oil, but they do not have any NDPE commitments. Then also we did research on the Indonesian domestic biofuel uh, leakage market. So uh, the Indonesia uh, biofuel market for, for that market, the Indonesian government did not set any meaningful sustainability requirements. So what we have observed is that the companies that continue to defer, deforest in the last decades they no longer supply the NDPE market, but they started to supply this domestic biofuel market. And then finally, there are so-called shadow companies, uh, which also uh, often on purpose have opaque ownership structures. And through uh, related corporate entities, these kind of companies are able to continue deforesting, uh, but we, we, don't, we do not really know to which company groups they belong. Next slide, please. So other than uh, Southeast Asia, we also uh, observed palm oil trends in Latin America and West and Central Africa. Uh, and while these, uh, these regions are often presented as very promising regions for large-scale palm oil production. Uh, in reality, we saw that expansion did not always go as planned, or it was also not always as green as it was presented. So basically, we found that also in these regions, there are significant amounts of environmental and social, social sustainability concerns that are prominent. Looking specifically at West and Central Africa, we found that expansion did not occur as planned. Um, so there are many uh, stranded lands or stranded assets uh, in the sense that 27 projects that covered 1.37 million hectares uh, of projects failed in the negotiation phase or were abandoned between 2008 and 2019. So basically those, this huge area can no longer be developed as oil palm plantation. And one of the explanatory factors is that there has been considerable community resistance. Um, and these conflicts between companies and, and local communities uh, have caused considerable operational costs also for companies from these violent conflicts. In Africa, we also see there are a few or a handful of players that continue to drive expansion of oil palm, uh, although, as I said, it's at a slower pace and also at a, at a lower scale than was anticipated. And for these companies that you can see on the right, like Sokfin, Wilmar, Olam, uh, we found also indications of some severe social and environmental violations. In Latin America, uh, indeed, the, there's much lower environmental impact compared to, for instance, beef and soy, because most of the oil palm expansion is taking place on areas that have been already developed, such as pastures. Um, but still, we did find that also here, um, yeah, there is some expansion on, on new forest, basically. And also, particularly, there are a lot of social uh, conflicts and displacements linked to oil palm expansion and also some forms of local deforestation. And also, we did run one report, for instance, on Brazil, uh, showing that it, Brazil is often presenting oil palm as a, as a very green solution only on existing lands, but uh, also our research showed that there's also expansion even in the Brazilian Amazon. For all these uh, topics I'm discussing at the moment, uh, you can find uh, full reports online on our Chainrex Research website. Next slide, please. 
So now moving to uh, the soy and beef industries. Um, so actually here NDPE process and the adoption of NDPE commitments is very slow. Uh, and, a, and a catalyst reaction, as we saw in the palm oil sector, did not occur at all. So basically, we conclude that voluntary commitments have been insufficient for Latin American soy and beef. And the, the major deforestation risk uh, companies such as Cargill, JBS, or Minerva, they continuously delay on their target zero deforestation deadlines. So initially, uh, under, for instance, the New York Declaration of Forest or the Zero Consumer Goods Forum, the Consumer Goods Forum, uh, companies committed to 2020 deadlines, but uh, meanwhile, it's shifted to 2030 or even later. So on the right uh, figure, which is based on Forest 500 data of 2023, you see that of the 315 uh, 350 companies they have assessed uh, for soy, only 43% have some form of deforestation commitment. And for beef and leather, this is even worse, only 26%. And chain reaction research estimates that the effective uh, NDPE commitments implementation is about 80% in palm oil, might even be larger right now. This was some years ago. So what are some explanatory factors for these differences? Uh, well, first of all, the nature of beef and soy supply chains, they are very complex and often very non-transparent. So for instance, in beef, there are numerous direct and indirect suppliers. Uh, but also we could conclude that international action uh, is not really well, it has not been so helpful in, in, in Latin America because more than international ad action, politics dictate the magnitude of, of forest loss in Latin America. So when in 2004 Lula uh, became president, we saw a very sharp uh, reduction of deforestation rates. And when Bolsonaro was inaugurated in 2019, the, the deforestation rates uh, reached record highs. Another trend that we have observed is that there's increased pressure on companies to be transparent. Uh, and we expect from some legislative binding initiatives that this will even improve. So we have the, the European deforestation regulation that is uh, now adopted, for instance. And we expect that this will accelerate the transition to zero deforestation. Uh, more than the voluntary commitments that have been insufficient. The, this is a legally binding uh, regulation, so that will likely accelerate the transition. Uh, chain reaction research, but also other uh, organizations such as TRACE or CDP are improving transparency and traceability in, in beef and soy supply chains. So with our chain reaction research company profiles, we have shown uh, what are the suppliers or the supply chains how how yeah we have made them more transparent for many companies in latin america then there are some private initiatives such as the soft commodity forums that unites uh, the largest soy traders that have also uh, made efforts to improve supplier traceability uh, but at the same time we feel there are some gaps there because they for instance do not disclose their suppliers contrary to palm oil, where there is a disclosure of palm oil lists. Uh, and also the focus is on illegal deforestation, uh, contrary to legal deforestation that also occurs a lot in Brazil. Next slide, please. So we started in 2013. So uh, we believe it's actually now really the time to also make up the balance, like how chain reaction research has contributed uh, to the reduction of emissions from deforestation and degradation. So as an overall trend, uh, we observe that investors and financial actors now do recognize that deforestation and linked emissions are a major contributor, contributor to climate change. So we have written more than 100 in-depth reports, more than 300 news items or so-called chains. And what has particularly worked there 
is that we have demonstrated that sustainability risks pose a material risk. So the sustainability risk, it's not only deforestation, we have also looked into social issues and under other environmental impacts. And we have looked how they can be a financial risk to investors and financiers, for instance, showing that uh, there is lack of market access, showing that uh, deforestation gives regulatory costs or operational costs to companies. Uh, and also showing that uh, these social issues can lead, for instance, to uh, reputational risks for companies. What also worked very well is the continuous monitoring of NDPE coverage. So each year we published a top 10 uh, deforesters reports, particularly linked to palm oil in Indonesia. And we have also introduced some methodologies that supported financial transparency, which gave insight on who is financing certain supply chains with deforestation. But I leave it uh, after my presentation to Profundo to, to dive into this. Then we have been engaging with, with companies through uh, activist investors, such as Green Century. Uh, and since Green Century is also here in the presentation, I leave it also to, to uh, Leslie later to, to dive into how chain reaction research outputs have supported investors. And then finally, we have shaped, uh, helped shaping policy and corporate debates. Uh, so we have worked on the EODR or the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive. Uh, for instance, we have made very concrete that it's very unlikely that some of the Brazilian meat packers are going to be uh, compliant with the EUDR. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide. Uh, and despite all the progress we have achieved, we also feel that there is still a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, so, first of all, both under national and international uh, legislation, not all global critical ecosystems are, are protected very well. So, for instance, under this deforestation regulation, uh, we know, for instance, that the Brazilian Cerrado or the Pantanal are not protected, and also peatlands are not protected under the EUDR. Under, for instance, Indonesia, Indonesia, Indonesia's peatland moratoria. We also know that only 30% of the peatland is protected. Uh, and under Brazilian's forest code, we know that 65 to 80% of the land can still be cleared with the right environmental licenses. Then we have also argued for the need of cross commodity policies um, because we saw that they were underlooked in many uh, regulations and in codes of conduct, for instance. So the cross-commodity policies imply that there are some companies that have been successful in eliminating deforestation from their palm oil suppliers, for instance, but at the same time, some of these suppliers continue to deforest for other uh, activities such as mining or timber. I have already discussed the risk of leakage markets. Um, and then there are also some very uh, recent emerging threats, particularly for uh, Indonesia that may increase deforestation in the near future. So there was the adoption of the omnibus law recently for which critics uh, fear that it will weaken environmental safeguards. So, for instance, it's probably going to be easier for exploitive businesses to, to, to basically do their activities in protected forest areas. Also, it's not very known at the moment what will be the long-term effect for, of the failure to extend the palm oil permit moratorium since September 2021. And also there's evidence that some of the companies uh, of timber, palm oil and mining that saw their licenses being revoked uh, last year, we saw some evidence that they are now starting to clear their uh, concessions. And particularly Aid Environment uh, made a published a recent report showing that uh, 10 companies already deforested 10,000 hectares in the first half of 2023. 
So almost the last point, social issues and exploitation. So we have the NDPE and the E stands for no exploitation, uh, but this is not standardized. What is uh, falling under the notion of exploitation? So companies can basically make up their own rules, what they consider to be important as social issues. Um, this might improve under the upcoming corporate sustainability due diligence directive. But what we see, for instance, now, uh, which is also based on Forest 500 data, is that especially in the beef and leather sectors, there's only very few companies that have, for instance, FBIC policies, so free and prior informed consent policies. And then finally, uh, there there is this transition ongoing for fossil fuels to biofuels. And we saw, for instance, in Brazil, Colombia, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, that many companies are now uh, increasing the mandate for the use of palm oil and soybean oil as a feedstock to produce biofuels. And uh, some civil society organizations have raised concerns that it might result in 3.2 million extra deforestation by 2030. And what we also see is that many of these energy and biofuel companies, they do not have any zero deforestation policies. And also they are not transparent on who are their suppliers. I now hand it over to Gerard Rijk of Profundo. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Um, nice photograph here. Um, in the next eight slides, we uh, like to discuss five tools that CRR focused on in the last 10 years to give financial institutions and civil society organizations more insight into the potential value at risk due to tropical deforestation. Um, these value risks can hit the, uh, the value of investment and of pension funds and money in a material way. Well, the first one, um, CRR valued deforestation impacts based on the risk of a reduction in revenue opportunities. That is the market access risk. Uh, also, the impact of change regulation, the impact of higher financing costs have been valued. Through this, CRR gave sustainability officers at uh, financial institution tool to have better discussions with their fund managers. Uh, these fund managers often dislike uh, interference by sustainability officers with their companies. So this information was really uh, very helpful to, to, to start discussions. Um, also, the, the calculations have proven have proven outcomes for, for instance, IOI and SSMS, whose stock market capitalization values have been hurt uh, significantly. The second one. CRR developed a reputation valuation tool, which is very useful for downstream companies. I will come back later on that. Uh, the third one, CRR confronted forest risk investments uh, by financial institutions with their own policies, which gave ground to, uh, to, to, to discussion. Uh, fourth, uh, chain reaction research developed a profit distribution uh, model for palm oil, beef, soy, uh, and um, this uh, this enabled the answering questions like who is earning what in uh, uh, and who can bear the cost of transition to sustainability. And finally, chain reaction research calculated the cost needed to implement and verify zero deforestation policies. And also on this, I will come back in a later uh, sheet. In the next slides, I like to dig deeper in these uh, these five points. Uh, next slide. Thanks. Uh, this this table is an example of the calculation of market access risk and shows the potential impact of deforestation risk for the large meat processors in uh, in Brazil. So what could happen in case of, of the European Union deforestation regulation? You can see here uh, how uh, 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 these companies have a 2 to 5% uh, uh, revenue exposure to the uh, EU. And this can culminate in a value at risk, which is 10 to 15% of the market capitalization 
of the companies. Well, that is really serious business. Uh, this slide does not include reputation value at risk. In view of the low enterprise value EBITDA valuation, that's a very important measure to value companies. Uh, these companies probably have not much reputation value left. Uh, reputation value is mainly applicable to downstream companies with a high brand value. Uh, they can be hurt significantly by reputation risk, and this, uh, this can be substantial. A positive reputation risk can help the valuation by plus 20%, while a bad reputation uh, can uh, hurt a stock price by uh, by 30%. So the difference between a company and a, comp and a stock that is hurt by a bad reputation, then the index goes down from 100 to 70. And with a good reputation, you can move up from 100 to 20. So the difference can be 70% in reputation. So that's really uh, material. Uh, next slide, please. Well, financing risk is uh, is uh, linked to the fact that financial institutions stop uh, or reduce lending money to an unsustainable company or ask higher rates because of uh, of high risk. Well, the table here shows how the in the period uh, 2013 to 2022, the financing of palm oil companies in Indonesia uh, has declined by 56%. You can see that on the last line of this uh, of this table. Uh, European financial institution reduced their percentage of total financing, as you can see. Uh, and um, um, uh, and uh, of course, their also their nominal financing has declined uh, substantially. Other regions saw um, a higher percentage contribution. Uh, but most of them also had a lower nominal and absolute uh, lending to uh, Indonesian uh, palm oil plantations. Only the North American institutions, financial institutions, increased their nominal financing flows. Uh, these changes have an impact on the value of a company. More expensive financing, financing means, per definition, a higher cost of capital. And usually CRR worked with various scenarios to show the potential impact on the value of a company uh, because of an increase in the uh, rate of interest. Um, next slide, please. Well, then the uh, profit distribution model, often used in CRR research and increasingly by Profundo in other reports on various uh, other sectors. Um, as a first step, an ana analysis needs to be made about the supply chain, the various levels, and the application of, in this example, uh, palm oil. And, the conversion, and also what's important are the conversion rates for tons of palm oil into, uh, for instance, liters of biofuels or into oleochemicals. So this, uh, this, 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 uh, um, uh, this model is 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 used in also for beef and for uh, for 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 leather etc. Uh, next slide. Now the next step is to calculate the gross profits and the operating profits made on tons of palm oil or embedded palm oil. In every step of the chain, value is added to embedded palm oil. It gets more expensive and the profit margins often also move up, certainly in absolute terms. At the end of the supply chain, fast-moving consumer good companies, uh, like food companies, branded food companies, but also home and personal care companies which use palm oil, and retailers earn the largest profit in the chain on the same ton of palm oil produced by a plantation at the start of the chain. For instance, while the total of plantation uh, plantations earn 30% of gross profit on this ton of palm oil. Uh, fast moving consumer good companies and retail uh, companies earn 66%. That is the addition of 38%. You can see that in the second uh, in the second column, 38% for fast moving consumer good companies and 28% for uh, 
for retail companies. In total, 66% of all gross profits uh, and 52% of operating profit um, uh, is made by uh, fast moving consumer goods and retail. Of the total gross profit or uh, um, operating profit in, in the chain. Well, this, these data give a starting point on who is uh, who can pay what to make the palm oil chain uh, sustainable and NDPE proof. Uh, civil society organizations increasingly like this methodology now that accountability for external and societal costs gets higher on the agenda. Uh, next slide, please. Well, this the 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 building blocks of the profit chain model consist of company analysis many companies companies indicate how much profits they make on commodities as a result we see a top four uh, of uh, consisting of wilmar pt pertamina unilever and pepsico just see how unilever and pepsico with much smaller volumes of palm oil they are fast moving consumer good companies than wilmar make substantial profits. That's because they have those much higher, uh, the pricing up and the high margins. Uh, nevertheless, Wilmar is on top of the list. Um, another CRR analysis showed that Wilmar has a very low uptake of RSPO certified palm. While it has the largest consumer footprint of consumer products based on palm oil. Yes, Wilmar is also, and not everybody knows that also an fast moving consumer good company. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, uh, there, are, there are two slides uh, on uh, the e uh, European Union supply chains in forest risk commodities and the relative costs to pay for zero deforestation execution. Again, based on input of the profit distribution model and the pricing up mechanisms included in that. Um, and based on that, CRR was able to calculate that for palm oil, these costs are 2.5% of the end value. And then we don't include the cost of segregated uh, supply chains and 3.5% when we include segregated supply chains. Uh, consider that palm oil is only a small part, for instance, of shampoo uh, made by Procter & Gamble. And these costs, which you see here, the 2.5 to 3.5, they will be only a part of a bottle of shampoo. And, the, and these costs of a bottle of shampoo, if you would include this kind of costs uh, to get an NDPE proof supply chain, would cost around 0.11% on a retail price increase. And I already several times said that the bottle of uh, head and shoulder will increase from $3 to three dollars so really nothing in the next slide yes this one uh, in this table the same is done for beef leather and soy note that the 6.8 percent for soy is only for the soy embedded in for instance one liter of milk and soy is let and take into account soy is less than 10 percent of input material for that milk so zero deforestation and NDP would lead to a 0.7%, so only less than 10% of, uh, of that 6.8% uh, higher milk price. So also that is not a lot. And yes, inflation is bad, but uh, zero deforestation is much better. And now I like to hand over, I think, to Michel. Thank you very much, Peter. Hi everyone, my name is Michel Riemsma. I work at Solidaridad in Europe. Solidaridad is a civil society organization uh, that is promoting uh, responsible value chains in the global south. We work in Asia, Africa and Latin America on a wide variety of uh, commodities and uh, other products, uh, so it's also such as gold and textiles. Uh, my work is focusing on palm oil. And in this work as a policy influencer, I've been able to use the work of uh, chain reaction research in the past few years. I've previously worked at Profundo. I've seen the, the birth of chain reaction research from, uh, from nearby and it was really inspiring to see 
what Sarah and Gerard now have presented that they've achieved throughout these years. And I would also like to add now in my presentation what I've seen uh, CSO uh, do with the data. And next slide, please, for that. Um, I'll later get to two examples, but I first would like to, to uh, present four points on what I think that uh, how CSOs have used the CRR outputs in the past uh, 10 years. And in Sarah's and Gerard's presentation, you've already seen uh, these points coming back. But first of all, I'd like to flag that it's very important for CSOs to be able to hold companies accountable for what they are doing. And the research of chain reaction research, the beauty of it is it that it's publicly available to everyone. It's not one single NGO that has commissioned uh, a research report by uh, by a consultancy, and then the data is like more or less kept secret or just available for that one organization. But everyone can use this organization. And what you see happening then when a chain reaction research uh, research report is published is that different NGOs use it in different ways to uh, for their own uh, lobby and advocacy work. Like some companies, uh, some and CSOs really use it to uh, publicly uh, make statements about companies that are involved in deforestation or in other environmental or social uh, uh, controversies. Uh, other CSOs use it more uh, on the background to engage in talks with uh, with the companies that are addressed in the report. So uh, those are different ways of engagement with companies that uh, can be done based on the report. Um, as a second point, the reports are really helpful for uh, understanding the drivers of deforestation. Sara already addressed this in her presentation. And what we've seen throughout the years is that there becomes more and more information available, uh, for example, via the chain reaction research reports on what the exact drivers of deforestation in commodity supply chains are. And uh, the examples of uh, Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia are very insightful for this. Um, it also allows us, as a third point, to monitor trends and developments. Uh, so, for example, that in Southeast Asia, the uh, deforestation rates are dropping, but what's the reason for that and what is happening on other continents, it's really helpful to have sources as CSR, CRR to, uh, to look into and also to um, sort of have a sanity check as an NGO to what your theory of change is, uh, uh, yeah, if it really works. Because we have now 10 years of re uh, research reports and in this period of time, the campaigning has really changed over the years. If I, zoom down on the palm oil sector, and we see that uh, 10 years ago, uh, the situation was really bad. NGOs were also uh, uh, campaigning a lot about the sector because there was so much deforestation. And then uh, if you read back through all the reports, you see that in 2015 and later on, more and more NDPE policies came into place. And later on, you see that the deforestation is decreasing. It's still there, and it's very important to still pinpoint the ones that are involved in deforestation, but it's also important to see that there really is an, uh, an decrease in deforestation. And for CSOs, that's an important sign to start thinking, well, we've had success in a sense with our campaigns. Companies have been started to uh, behave more responsible. How do we want to update our approach toward the companies? Um, and uh, as a fourth point, I've, um, I think it's important that the value chain analysis that chain reaction research made enabled uh, CSOs to, to dive deeper into uh, who is earning what into the, in different uh, supply chains. Uh, next slide, please. And one of the examples how I've used uh, the data in my work at Solidaridad is, for example, with the deforestation data on palm oil in uh, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, in this case, that uh, chain reaction research presented. Um, because in 2022, they showed that none of the 10 largest deforesters in 2021 can be conclusively linked to the end of the email. And uh, that was a big step forward for, for the sector. It was an important notification to know, okay, something is working in a sense. It's of course not uh, uh, done yet in a sense, as Sarah already showed, there are still a lot of uh, uh, issues to be resolved, but 
it's it's going in the right direction it shows um and um the the second half of this quote is also interesting to look at because it shows that uh, another thing that chain reaction research does that i think other research institutes maybe don't is that they look for example into this minority shares in a mill and that's a very difficult part of the research yeah. uh finding out which company is the uh beneficial owner at the end of the of the day of a specific mill and that uh really allows for more transparency along the supply chain uh the next slide please and i would like to close with another example of how i used the work of CRR at Solidaridad. Uh, the value chain analysis that Gerard presented in detail with all these nice tables and percentages and graphs, we've turned to that into uh, these two uh, nicely looking yellow graphs that we hope are uh, 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 readable in a, uh, that the letters are not too, too small at this moment. Um, but what it showed for us is that uh, even though uh, smallholder farmers have a very important role to play in the production of palm oil, uh, they only have a very low share in the profits. And uh, this helps us to, uh, to, to engage with downstream producers, so food manufacturers and retailers, uh, to, to tell them, hey, uh, listen up. You're working on the supply chain. It costs you only a little bit of money to uh, ensure that the supply chain becomes more sustainable. But you're not doing this. What are the hiccups to to uh, the hurdles to overcome to ensure that the smallholders at the end of the supply chain have a uh, a better income at the end of the day? Because the producers, if they are not uh, in a position to produce in a sustainable way and get a fair income for that then uh, it's also not going to work out with all these NDPE policies. So we need to ensure that like this 38% for the large companies becomes a little bit less and the 0% of the smallholders becomes a little bit more. Even though smallholders themselves often say that in the uh, oil palm industry, they can uh, have a better income than for example, in cacao or in uh, coconut industry, but it's still, uh, uh, a very low price compared to uh, income compared to what uh, companies downstream make. So uh, our targets are now for the coming years is to ensure that this zero percent of the smallholders becomes a bit more than that. And with that, I would like to hand over to the next speaker. Hi everyone. I'm Leslie Samuel Rich. I'm the president of the Green Century Funds. I'm having, there we go. Um, I'm based here in Boston, Massachusetts in the United States. And we have been lucky enough to be part of the consortium um, working with CRR over the last 10 years. And I just wanna make a few points about our role in the consortium and how it has been an incredible resource um, and positive force in helping the investment community address deforestation. So the, the chain of work um, obviously starts with all the previous speakers from the on the ground research to the financial analysis to then the communication of that. And Green Century Funds plays a role at the end in taking that information um, and using it as an investor um, and as a shareholder advocate to press companies to make those changes, as well as to educate the broader investor community about the risks of deforestation um, and encouraging them to become active with the companies in their portfolios. You know, looking back 10 years ago, there was a moral and ethical argument um, in the investor community to stop deforestation, but there really wasn't much of a financial um, analysis reason to do it. And so investors were not very active on it. Um, with the reports and analysis that have come out, uh, Green Century, um, as well as Climate Advisors, as well as our other partners, have been able to educate more investors about these risks. Um, and they have taken substantial action, um, hopefully following our lead, but also their own. Um, and 
you know, before 10 years ago, Rubico, for example, was active in Europe, but there weren't many others. Um, and there was really limited corporate engagement and commitments. Um, as one of the speakers previously mentioned, only 5% of the palm oil chain was covered with a zero deforestation or NDPE policy. And now 10 years later, it's up over 80%. So those are the top line pieces. I wanted to highlight three different buckets of work that has happened um, that Green Century has been a part of. Um, so in 2000, one of the first one I should say is actually working with companies in our portfolio and in the Green Century funds. Um, and our first engagement was with Kellogg in 2013 and working with them um, in the US companies don't usually meet as easily with investors. Um, but then we also have a process through which we can put a question on their annual proxy and other shareholders can vote on that. And the companies generally do not welcome such a proposal to be on their annual ballot. And so we have that leverage when we're working with them. And with Kellogg, we had a set of meetings with them and they, they were interested in what we had to say about limiting deforestation with their palm oil supply chain. Um, but we needed to file a shareholder resolution to actually push them to move. Um, and through that pressure at the very last minute before the shareholder proposal was going to be filed, they agreed to a zero deforestation policy. Green Century has gone on to secure other policies with ConAgra, ADM, the first cross commodity policy, um, and recently Kraft Heinz, which we think um, has the most comprehensive forest protection policy of any food company in the world. Um, we also have addressed some of the leakage market um, by trying to pressure more of the US banks to stop their financing. As, as Gerard noted, the overall financing has not gone down, um, but we have been able to get City, JP Morgan, and Morgan Stanley to take action on limiting or eliminating financing for projects associated with deforestation. And we hope that um, those movements by these three large banks will encourage other banks to take the same action and will bring those numbers down. Um, and then Third, I think that just an overall investor action, um, notably by the New York State Pension Fund, one of the most active pension funds in the U.S. on this issue is notable. And the whole model is actually something that I think can be replicated in having not just the financial sector working together or not just NGOs or not just researchers, but having that whole pathway leading to concrete actions is something that I think that this, this project and this work um, can, we can keep using it on these issues, but also it's applicable to other issues. Um, and we obviously still have work to do, uh, but just by the virtue of the higher level of involvement, engagement, and awareness of these issues in the investor community, it's its like night and day from the beginning of the project. Um, no one was working really in any substantial way on forest protection um, and zero deforestation and NDPE policies here in the US um, and not as many in Europe. And now it is just a much bigger set of work that involves um, all levels and all sorts of investors. Um, we still are trying to involve more um, and having them incorporate it into their financial risk analysis and become more engaged, but it's a very positive step in the last 10 years to do that. Um, we also have just seen the models that we've used in dealing with palm oil applicable to Latin America. As noted previously, the progress is trickier and harder to secure, but we are encouraged by some of the corporate commitments, including those that extend over to the Sahado, um, which is an often neglected area in terms of coverage. Um, and then lastly, as 
the idea of nature financing and biodiversity have taken hold in Europe and are now finally getting the increased attention here in the United States. I think that the NDPE work falls under that larger umbrella and has more legs to it um, in the future in that as people look at biodiversity and protecting nature that it is essential that we keep working on the forest protection work and I'm, I'm hoping that more investors see that as the way to go. And with that, I'll close. Great. Thank you, Leslie, for your presentation and all the work that you've done for the consortium. And thank you to all of our presenters today. Um, now we have time for a short Q&A. We have a few minutes left. As I, uh, as I mentioned up front, CR will be pausing after our event today. So in that context, we have a great question to close today. I'd like to get the uh, view from each of our presenters on this question. Um, uh, uh, Leslie had just touched on some of this during her presentation, but I'd like to get um, everybody's thoughts. What would you say are the key remaining concerns or issues that need attention uh, relating to palm oil and other commodities regarding deforestation and more broadly, any emerging threats to forests that may become more alarming in the future? We can start with, uh, with Sarah. Hi. Um, yeah, so I think I addressed this question partly also in my presentation because I showed uh, some of the areas of concerns that we still have. So I think, uh, well, in general, obviously, in Latin America, there's still a lot of work to be done, uh, not necessarily linked to palm oil, but especially also linked to beef, leather and soy. Um, but specifically to palm oil, we see some emerging threats, uh, such as the omnibus law, uh, the, the, the failure to extend the palm oil moratorium. We see this uh, increase of deforestation linked to the industrial tree sector. Um, yeah, so that, that are just some of the emerging threats that may increase deforestation over time. Uh, and especially as we also concluded that sometimes politics more than international action dictate forest loss, it can also happen that with any new government in, in Indonesia or Brazil, that we can also expect that deforestation will increase in the near future. I think the domestic biofuel market in Indonesia is a very uh, concerning development, although it's obviously meant to have uh, positive results for the climate. We see that there's also a lot of unintended negative impacts from uh, the, the search for palm oil and soybean oil for to be used as feedstock for the biofuel industry. Um, then social issues in supply chains, I think they're often overlooked. I would uh, personally also like very much if we would pay more attention to that, but I think with the corporate sustainability due diligence directive in Europe, this might also uh, have increased attention. I could say more, but I think I also should leave it to the other speakers to, uh, to respond. Great. Great, thanks, Sarah. Let's go to Harar next. Yeah, I, I, I would only like to add the, uh, on which we made the study in depth study. Uh, and Sarah already mentioned it earlier on about the cross commodity and uh, the cross commodity NDPE policies. And that is not about multi commodity NDPE policy. So it's not that your that companies only focus, okay, I'm using uh, beef and I have an NDPE policy on beef and I have I use palm and I have an NDPE policy on palm. That is a multi-commodity NDPE policy. Now it's the, the accountability for a company should be much more um, intense. So when you are buying palm oil from a company, you sh companies should also uh, uh, ask their uh, their uh, suppliers that they also don't uh, um, deforest in other areas where they are active, sometimes in mining, sometimes in timber. Uh, while Unilever is not buying those mining products or those timber products, they should also ask for 
uh, for, for for stopping this kind of deforestation. And then it then the then the whole platform can be leveraged uh, enormously. By the way, Unilever is already applying a cross commodity policy, but uh, that's the only one. Most companies, by far, ninety nine percent, don't apply cross commodity policies. Great, thanks for this point, Gerard. Uh, next, um, Michelle. Yeah, I missed your question. Yeah, what would you say are the key remaining concerns or issues that need attention relating to commodity-driven deforestation, and what are some uh, emerging threats to forests that may become uh, increasing alarming in the in the future? Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, then I, I want to repeat what I've already said uh, because of well, I have the opportunity now to to uh, uh, voice the solidarity standpoint, and I think it's very important to to look uh, at the deforestation angle, not from the point of uh, cleaning your own supply chain, making sure that there's no deforestation on your own plate, but uh, making sure that uh, the farmers that are actually uh, uh, the ones who have to produce in a sustainable way, deforestation-free and with no social and environmental uh, issues in, in, in their work, that they are the ones that can do that in uh, in a good way and ensure that uh, the companies that are at the end of the supply chain uh, contribute to that and ensure a fair value distribution uh, all the way along the chain towards the farmer. Great. Uh, thanks for those points. Um, Leslie, we'll give you the last word here. <laughs> wow, it's a lot of pressure. <laughs> um, from our point of view, it is that ensuring that the policy work continues to happen and supports us moving forward on NDPE policies and that investors like Green Century and others really pressure the companies to fulfill their commitments, um, to meet their deadlines and to not just give lip service to the commitments they've made. Great, uh, thank you for that. And thanks again to our uh, presenters. Um, we've come to the end of today's event. We really appreciate everyone's participation. Please contact us if you have any questions and also to stay in touch. Uh, we hope you enjoy the uh, rest of your day. Thank you.